All right, welcome everyone to the Future of Enterprise Architecture. Uh, my name is Ingar Grev, I'm with EA Principles. And uh, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping before we get started here. Please make sure that you turn off any frequently refreshing, refreshing applications like email, Dropbox, social media, and so forth. Um, this is a bandwidth intensive webinar and it's a good practice to have anytime you're on a webinar. Uh, if uh, you're watching YouTube or you got YouTube on the background, or you got your Spotify still on, go ahead and exit out of those. If you're at home, please ask others to turn off their bandwidth intensive applications like streaming streaming video or like a Netflix or something like that or Xbox or whatever they're doing. So ask them to do that too because it does make an impact. Um, and uh, take notes while you're going through it. And if you stay all the way through the end, um, we will give you the email address you need to get uh, to get some of the notes from this talk. So if you uh, so again, if you stay all the way to the end, we'll reward you with giving you all the notes from this talk. All right, so, and also while you're at it, chat us up on Slido. Just go to www.slido, uh, it's not slido.com, it's <laughs> www.sli.do and join, and join event 6777. That's how we're gonna communicate with you during this talk. So appreciate you t uh, getting over there and setting, this up, setting that up for you right now. Uh, setting it up for yourself right now. Our presenters today uh, are, we're gonna start off with uh, Mr. Graham Beresford from uh, the UK. He is uh, the founder and managing director of the Fancier Limited. A um, couple of things about Graham is that he, uh, the, the Avancier is uh, specializes in high quality professional training and consulting in both enterprise and solution architecture. Uh, Graham is the publisher of Method. Oh, he's a uh, his website uh, has uh, published methods for enterprise and solution architecture, and we'll present his website at the end. But just let you know what it is really quickly: it's Avancier.website. A really interesting URL. Uh, he's a teacher of TOGAF and BCS professional certificates in enterprise and solution architecture. And his customers have included Atos, Roche, Siemens, Barclays, uh, Barclays, sorry, EDF, EDS, and local governments. Um, and so Dr. Stephen Ellis, our other presenter, is the founder and CEO of EA Principles. He is one of the world's foremost innovators, consultants, lecturers, educators, and trainers serving the enterprise architecture industry. He works closely with businesses and technology, business and technology leaders in business transformations. Uh, Dr. Ellis has trained and educated over 4,000 professionals in EA TOGAF, as well as many others in US Federal Enterprise Architecture, or FEA. He is a regular keynote speaker at global EA conferences and summits, and has conducted many EA executive workshops for Fortune 50 companies and EA training for many universities, including Columbia University. He's an adjunct professor at several universities, and Steve also teaches enterprise architecture as well as systems analysis and design at the graduate level. He is also taught technology forecasting assessments, knowledge management, and IT project and change management over the span of several years. Okay, so we got a great all the two two uh, two global uh, all stars here. So I want to go ahead and turn it over right now to. Mr. Beresford uh, to give his talk. Graham, why don't you go ahead and take it over? Okay, Steve's asked me to talk uh, in this webinar about the future of EA, uh, and he's asked me many questions over the years, which I've assembled into some kind of plausible sequence, inserted one, one or two for continuity. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about the future of EA in, a, uh, in connection with solution architecture to be discussed. Uh, this is a list of questions that will be answered. I'm not going to go through these now, just to give you a, a vague idea of what's coming. Uh, and we're going to ask poll questions, uh, which you should answer on Slido as we go through. Uh, we'll collect the answers uh, and, and report them at the end of the presentation, uh, rather than interrupt the flow uh, as we go through. There are, there are five slides with poll questions on. so. Uh, if you could answer these first two, if you have Slido open, uh, that would be helpful. It'd be interesting to see the results at the end. Are you working in an architect role currently? Uh, and are you managing architects currently? Well, I'm sure if you've got Slido open, you've you've done your yes, no by now. So I, I'll move on. So where should we start? Uh, well, there's a famous quote here from George Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, it does help in understanding EA to understand EA history. Uh, there's a lot of it. There's a tiny fragment of it um, in, in, the, in the graphic there. Um, what did EA mean when it started? Most people would trace it back to the beginning of the 80s, 
IBM had a methodology called business systems planning. Uh, basically, they were trying to sell mainframe computers, uh, but they realized they couldn't sell computers, take a big box into a, 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 an enterprise and say, would you like one of these? Uh, it has to be sold on its use. So how to support roles and processes using information systems, how to design the digitization, as we call it nowadays, of business capabilities. I've expressed these in modern words, but those were the messages um, 37 years ago. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, by the way, I, I put in a reference here to uh, some historical references you can find. I'm going to draw from a few of those as we go through. Uh, starting with, uh, I think, what most people would say was the first uh, definitive paper on uh, enterprise architecture, although the term wasn't used, the PRISM report. It promoted taking a strategic view of distributed systems architecture, divided architecture into four domains, suggested documenting both baseline and target, defining principles and standards, and making sure that the target architecture, target architecture conformed to them. All of those things you can see in TOGAF today, very prominently. Uh, some people uh, have the impression that John Zachman invented EA, which isn't really true. He did, however, um, uh, publicize it and promoted it. Uh, he promoted taking a more disciplined approach to the description of an enterprise's business activity systems. Uh, he often used to draw an analogy between an enterprise uh, systems and uh, building a Boeing 747. Uh, and messages would be if managers don't know how what they're managing, how can they manage it? Uh, he's recommended we document the structure and behavior of these systems in excruciating detail. That was a phrase he used. And at several levels of abstraction, in fact, five levels, five different levels of abstraction from the operational systems. Uh, it was inspirational in its day. Uh, but today, none of our customers use the Zachman framework for enterprise architecture. So uh, what do they see as enterprise architecture? If you go into uh, internet discussion groups, particularly in LinkedIn, you'll find people with very different views. Some people just translate enterprise as business uh, and say that the CEO is the enterprise architect. Uh, well, that's not really the case. Um, Business strategy goals and organization management structure, all these things inform enterprise architecture. They can be influenced by it, but they're not what enterprise architects are there to define. The focus of enterprise architecture is on business roles and processes, specifically the ones that create and use business data. Uh, and increasingly, the use of that data by decision makers. Uh, I've inserted a slide here on uh, a survey by Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, on decision making by um, uh, executives, where they think they're going to be making decisions, uh, and how far they are data driven. 53% said they are somewhat data driven, 39% said they are highly data driven, and 61% said they could rely on data analysis more. So, uh, does EA equal enterprise technology architecture, there's certainly another school of thought who only see enterprise architecture as being about information technologies. And it's true that enterprise architects are often involved in defining IT strategies, standards, roadmaps, et cetera, but it isn't really their primary purpose. It is true that in some organizations, enterprise architecture is limited to that domain. Um, and there is a kind of rationale for that. It's the first level of maturity in um, in EAS strategy, there's, there's a reference to that book in the in the references. Um, the generic platform technologies are the easiest things to standardize. I've put a list here of, uh, of some things you can standardize quite relatively easily. Uh, and once you've done that, it makes the higher levels of enterprise architecture um, easier. Uh, Ross Vaughan and Robertson, the, the authors of this book, uh, suggested the first level of maturity is the technology and then the data and the applications and then uh, the business roles and processes. Uh, interestingly, down at the bottom here, the server side, uh, control of that is shifting uh, gradually to cloud service providers. That's a trend at the moment. So uh, does that mean enterprise architecture is disappearing? Not at all, because its focus is really, uh, its focus is really here. Um, it's about digitizing roles and processes that create new data using business applications. So the applications that help people do the business. Of course, applications serve the business and they depend upon technology, so you can't separate them out from those. 
but the, the center of EA is that business applications layer. Uh, I've got some definitions of the, uh, the three layers here, which I've taken from uh, Archimate. I'm not going to dwell on the definitions, except to say this is basically a client server stack from the top down. Uh, the customers are served by the business, the business is served by the applications and data, and they, they are served by the infrastructure technologies. Uh, so one of Steve's questions, who are most active with EA? Um, judging by uh, people who attend courses, I think government institutions and financial institutions, why is that? I think essentially they are data processing business. Their business is capturing and using data. Um, money is data after all. Uh, and perhaps the most successful are, are those that are medium sized, they have cohesive business operations, interdependent systems, and they've got some a strong character in the leadership of the strategy and architecture. Our enterprise architects striving to document business systems as Zuckerman recommended. Uh, mostly they aren't nowadays. Um, we've discovered we can't do it. Uh, and even if we could, we couldn't maintain it. Uh, Zuckerman's um, analogy with the aeroplane doesn't really work. It's true that an aeroplane has millions of co-located entry parts. Systems are hard, rigidly defined. Engineering and applications business systems is um, an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude uh, more complex. There are billions of highly distributed parts. The systems are very soft, complex, and uh, much more malleable than an aeroplane. Um, one of Avance's customers, who uh, is themselves an EA consultant, um, uh, sent me this uh, message from his experience. Uh, I've picked out a few words here that the architects become an ivory tower, long term targets no one will realize, and the world's changed before the targets can be reached. The enterprise architecture efforts has to be pitched at the right level. Understanding that rates of change differ widely across an organization. Uh, I had a, a, a banking customer recently uh, who could contrast their stock trading arm uh, with their need to uh, com compete with changes in the market continually and retail banking, which hasn't um, essentially changed its nature. So what are EAs doing? Uh, they're identifying data to support the business, ways to capitalize on that. Uh, they're standardizing, integrating, and optimizing. There's a lot of waste and duplication uh, in most uh, businesses' systems. They're defining roadmaps for changes, defining standards, principles, patterns, and checking that solution architects uh, follow these to, to avoid risks and suboptimal solutions. And finally, hopefully, while they're doing this, they're gaining the confidence of business and IT managers that their contribution is helpful uh, rather than uh, being disconnected from them. So is EA documentation needed at all? Um, certainly TOGAF thinks so. Uh, we can't yet model all the business systems to the depth and breadth that Zachman recommends and TOGAF implies. We can shine a spotlight on uh, where problems and opportunities arise, uh, document what we need for now, and hope that documentation will be useful next time we revisit uh, the area in question. So another poll question for you. Um, can you just do yes or no to do which modeling languages have you used in practice? Uh, UML, business process modeling notation, Archimate, IDEF, those are all three international standards, uh, uh, perhaps some other. Uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, which of those modeling languages has currency with them. Um, people are, uh, attending the presentation. So I, again, a few yes, no's clicks. I'm sure you've done those by now. Uh, must architects know a standard modeling language? Well, yes, architects must describe systems. That's certainly clear. And broad education in modeling languages helps, helps people to do that. I personally recommend in terms of a learning path, UML, then Archimate, then BPMN. But uh, being an expert in a modeling language, having a modeling language certificate certainly doesn't make you an arch architect, far from it. In practice, um, the use of modeling languages rarely corresponds to the published standards. Uh, people show me examples that are uh, quite horrendously different from what the standards would imply. The standards themselves are far from uh, perfect or unambiguous. Uh, one finds common terms like interface, function, and service are widely interpreted different ways. 
they mean different things in different modeling language standards. Um, uh, interface and service uh, mean virtually the same thing in UML, and they mean different things in uh, in Archimate, uh, which makes it hard to be sure what diagram draws mean. So we're not at the uh, the level of the building industry with uh, architectural conventions. How does EA relate to other kinds of architecture? Well, for me, the solution architects are the engine room. Uh, we always need solution architects. We need solution architects to de develop silo systems. Uh, and we need solution architects to develop those systems in an EA context. Uh, EA is there to act as a design authority to validate what solution architects are doing. Solution architects, in turn, coordinate um, detailed domain and technical specialists working on specific projects. Uh, again, going back to my consultant friend, uh, there should be no disconnect between the EA and SA teams. They should belong to the same group, shared goals and objectives. Uh, I'm a great believer in socializing the enterprise and solution architect community so that they understand each other's uh, concerns and uh, are pulling in the same direction. We use this uh, chart of three levels, enterprise, solution, and software, or other technical specialism, top to bottom. Business, data stroke, information, applications, infrastructure, technology, left to right. I'm not going to dwell on this screen. Uh, I ask people in, in classes to pitch themselves in this space. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to dwell too long, on this, uh, too long on this. I don't want you to agonize over it. But uh, perhaps you could answer the questions in the, uh, in the poll. Which architecture level do you work in most? Enterprise solutions or software or other technical specialism? And which architecture domain do you work in most? From left to right, business data applications, uh, technology. What's the modern EA team like? In the UK, we have a standard called the Skills Framework for the Information Age, which has a section of roles and responsibilities called strategy and architecture, and enterprise and solution architects are classified under that. Quite often, um, what uh, might be called in the in the US uh, an EA team is called the strategy and architecture team here, and that could include uh, anybody working in in the space that we talked about, uh, uh, three levels and four domains, not just enterprise architects. So uh, I'm interested in. Um, in the audience uh, uh, organizations. If the enterprise you work in has some kind of EA or strategy and architecture team, how big is it? Is it less than six people, six to 12 people, larger than 12? Uh, I've had customers in all those categories, uh, but it's not common to have larger than 12, uh, except in the big banks and big government departments. How do architects relate to agile development? Steve has asked me. Well, just as enterprise architects steer solution architects, so solution architects shape and steer system development. Uh, well, whatever uh, development method is used, be it waterfall, iterative, or agile, solution architect uh, does what's needed for an agile project, which is to provide high-level requirements and high-level design documentation, uh, with especially with a focus on non-functional requirements, making sure they're understood early, uh, and that agile development allows them to be met. Uh, one of the classic problems is that agile developments build small scale systems which don't scale up in one way or another uh, to the production environment. How do people link uh, enterprise and solution architecture? Well, typically, um, solution architects produce outlines and high level designs. They take them to the enterprise architects for uh, review and the enterprise architects have their strategies, standards, principles, patterns, et cetera, uh, to review the, um, uh, the designs against, and also their knowledge and experience. I don't want to discount personal knowledge and experience here. What are the essential skills of architects? Certainly they need long and broad experience. They need strong analytical and communication skills. Uh, and of course, you would expect me to say knowledge of the concepts and techniques in our Enterprise Solution Architecture Training, which I'll come back to later. Uh, and to research where they don't know. Uh, they have to be confident people uh, who are willing to go out and find uh, when they don't know something, um, find out. Sometimes that means being a bit humble. 
uh, how can one measure whether EA is succeeding? Uh, there's a substantial website uh, presentation on the website uh, on ROI metrics. I've looked at various measures. Um, and in my view, uh, this is not a very popular view, most measures are unconvincing. Uh, measuring activity uh, is what mo many people do, which is not measuring success. Um, and, and any measurable success has a thousand fathers. So it's difficult to attribute the, the success of a, a project or a system to any particular source. Uh, in my view, the strategy and architecture team is working at a political level where uh, the interpersonal relationships matter, experience and judgment are, are judged by others. Uh, the architects have to convince their stakeholders on a daily basis that they are helping. They have to gather uh, stakeholder feedback and maybe gathering that feedback systematically and measuring that feedback systematically is one way of measuring success. Uh, what has remained stable since uh, EA started? Uh, I put this in, in modern terminology, but uh, although digital transformation, emerging technologies, disruptive changes, etc., is modern speak, uh, enterprise architecture has always been about that. The main, the main frame was a disruptive technology um, in the 1970s. It's always been about the, uh, the change that's necessary to, uh, to handle transformations. The things you see in TOGAF, uh, you can see um, some of these back in the PRISM report, um, some back earlier than that, 40 years ago, four architecture domains, four architecture types. And many uh, have had a cyclic development process. If you're familiar with TOGAF, um, where TAFIM, I've said here, Enterprise Architecture Planning, um, from Stephen Spiewak, FIAF and, and TOGAF, certainly TAFIM, FIAF and TOGAF have a cyclical process. Uh, less so actually EAP. The aims of enterprise architecture haven't really changed. Uh, I put them on the screen. I, I don't want to dwell on them. Um, I think we can all sign up to those as uh, uh, as being kind of self-evident. That's what we're trying to uh, achieve. What's changed uh, is interesting there. IT is no longer a mainframe. When I started, uh, computing was the mainframe in a room behind a locked door. That was uh, the be all and end all of security was the uh, the lock on the uh, computer room door. Uh, nowadays, employees carry devices, customers connect from remote locations. This distribution of systems, which was recognized in the PRISM report 1986, um, increased worries about availability and security of data to, uh, in, uh, re to remote users from remote sources. Apps have become more commoditized. We're not always talking about software development. It can be package implementation. Um, infrastructure and applications are moving into a cloud, although that can mean many different things. Uh, it often means simply being managed by a service provider. Um, recognition that strategy, strategy, strategy and agility must be uh, balanced. What about disruptive changes? This is the last of the 20 questions that I uh, have edited from Steve's various emails over the years. Um, cloud service provision, Internet of Things, big data analytics. Of course, uh, an enterprise architecture team might research those for their own sake. Not many enterprises really want to pay for pure research. Um, but once a business manager is engaged in, in these things and sees some potential in it, then the enterprise architect uh, is there to bring their knowledge of the, um, the enterprise systems, the application portfolio, the technology portfolio. Uh, and they can help by doing impact analysis. Uh, the future of EA, well, in short, uh, closer integration with solution architecture is, uh, is the vision that I'm trying to push here. Um, there is a, a, an associated paper, um, uh, which you'll have a link to at the, uh, at the end of the, the webinar. So the last three uh, poll questions. Do you or your architecture team use TOGAF? Do you or your architecture team use any other published method or framework? Would you or your team benefit from more education in architecture terms and concepts, uh, regardless of uh, the above? Again, it's just uh, yes, no questions. So I'm going to take a break now. I'd like to come back later. Um, I'd like to look at the uh, what we found from the, the poll answers uh, and, and make a few 
uh, concluding remarks. So um, I'm expecting my screen to be taken over. Okay, Graham, thank you. And so uh, uh, pre great talk. And again, uh, we'll show those poll results at the end of uh, at the end of the or after the Q and A session. Uh, right now, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Steve Els, who um, uh, will be talking to us about the future of enterprise architecture. So, Steve, why don't you go ahead and take over the screen? And uh, how about you tell us a little bit about what the future of enterprise architecture looks like? So the, the future of enterprise architecture. So the main value is, is uh, I think, linked to major change initiatives. It's not, at least initially, you're doing enterprise architecture for every nit or noid of change, but that, that you're starting to get engaged on the really big things. I see that as, as uh, where people have to focus better uh, in, their, in their enterprise architecture practices because Graham uh, alluded to the fact that it's hard to get all the information, yes, but it's, it's even harder to maintain it all as you're collecting new information. And so, so uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna succeed, you have to have a focus and a, and a, and a sweet spot would be the major transformation investments that you're making. The enterprise architects should be involved and that does tie to where they're wearing hats on the team, at least some folks are really expert solution architects integrated into a, an EA team. Uh, so the bottom line there is that enterprise architecture in the future has to be seen as crucial to problem solving. The opposite of ivory tower, the opposite of, oh yeah, we have enterprise architecture, but we don't know what the, those people are doing. They're in a different part of the organization. And you know, that's not, that's not going to be a, a good thing if, if, if uh, pe people queried say that they really, they know they have EA, but they don't know what they do, right? And so that ties to the second theme of performance or domain. And its ability, although Graham's a little skeptical from comments there, but to me, it's the ability to qualitatively and quantitatively dash for the role and value of EA throughout the systems development life cycle of major transformation investments. So for example, you could uh, say, the major investments uh, did the EA team have a look at before they were given money, where they were approved and funded? Um, how um, were and other other stage gates? Uh, did the EA uh, program have a chance to look at which standards they were using, which which uh, interfaces they were using, etc.? And then you could do um, that's more quantitative, perhaps, but qualitatively, did the EA team add any value? You know, what were your engagements like with the EA team at different points in time? So uh, I want to make one quick point on this is I had the, the, the uh, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. They are, of course, uh, is a school of system engineering. I was talking with their folks. I gave a, a, a keynote presentation on knowledge management and enterprise architecture and how they intersected and how knowledge management is a soft area, but it's critical. Uh, for enterprise architecture. And they said, well, it's good timing, but we're looking more at how do you quantitatively measure whether EA in general or any part of EA makes a difference and what kind of difference. And so they're setting up a lab, what they call the EA laboratory. And they were running, they were, the purpose of it was to run all kinds of simulations to say, what if I use framework X versus framework Y? And then they simulate, you know, over thousands of times to try to try to discern what did it make any difference? No framework, TOGAF framework, FIA approach, the Zachman approach, you know, different approaches. Which reference model? Which reference architecture? Which, uh, which, if we use principles or we didn't use principles, so on. So it's interesting. And again, it's at a graduate school, and they were looking to, to create more more academic uh, analysis of, of enterprise architecture. So I haven't I haven't seen any any reports come out of that. That was about three years ago. But there are a lot of people scratching their heads to say, well, who says that EA matters? And, you know, and to what degree does it matter? And where do we get the ROI and that type of thing? And so we're, let's say we're paying a million dollars a year for EA, or we, you know, can show me either qualitatively or quantitatively we're getting a return on investment or return on value. So, so again, a lot of work could be done to, uh, to better assess. But I do, I am a believer in some 
dashboard that would that would have qualitative and quantitative aspects that you could see trends uh, over time from the program to ultimately you know how how successful is our mature program so uh, so that's that's uh, the performance uh, aspect again the inputs what are, what are the steps for change and then what are the outputs and we, we could explore that uh, the future VA was going to have to be able to demonstrate that it does matter and some of it will be qualitative because because the business says it matters because the business says they want the the inputs uh, of the EA uh, team. Now it gets to the people. So who are the? What is the EA team? And uh, that'll tie tie to a little bit the the next one too in terms of people and process. But but something that I I emphasize a lot for future success in EA is that we really have to ramp up the knowledge, skills, and maturity. What I call the KSM, and that's not the 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 co the um. The, the chic, the terrorist chic, KSM. But the knowledge, skills, and maturity needs to be ramped up considerably uh, before one makes major investments, say, in tools, or, um, yeah, especially in tools. People are willing to make um, at least million-dollar investments in tools, whereas their knowledge, skills, and maturity are at a nadir. I've had people say, well, I couldn't get any money for framework training until I got a tool. So it's like on the critical path. And I go, well, it's kind of backwards. You know, you really need to understand what is an architecture landscape and what, what is the team necessary to be able to address stakeholder concerns in the architecture landscape. And with increasingly well-informed answers about impact analysis, what-if analysis, and the like. So, so knowledge, skills, uh, and maturity are, are critically important. And I think uh, the EA teams that succeed are, are, are looking at that. And again, a lot of you said that. Yes, it would be helpful to have more formal training. And uh, as to training, uh, it's people are amazed. But I can tell you that with with more formal training, with people who who understand this this uh, this algorithm here, that that the KSM is the priority, and they do they do the training in the sense of increasing the maturity, uh, knowledge, skills, and maturity, where you could measure the difference. That that in a few months' time, working still do the main job, but working with, with coaches and training and coaches, that you really can have the dashboard of difference uh, where people are qualitatively saying it makes a huge difference and they can show that it made a difference in terms of which meetings they get invited to, which which major transformation efforts they're involved with. So it, it can be something that makes a difference in, in a uh, month's time, but it has to be uh, supported down and also has to integrate flow and that ties with the process the roles and responsibilities via other planning change and governance methods with workflows all that needs to be sorted out a lot of people are very immature in terms of who's responsible for what and that's where Graham was talking a little bit about you know what are the enterprise architects who are they vis-a-vis -vis the solution architects vis-a-vis -vis the software architects well it all has to be more holistic and we have to see it in terms of a life cycle how it all comes together in terms of uh, you know what is success at different uh, you know chunks of, of work, and how can we how can we uh, uh, clearly and efficiently uh, get involved so that we are asking the right questions and we're we're providing the right information um, and it's and uh, not overwhelmed by just maintaining a repository. And I'll talk to that in in a moment. So the information part, I really think that it, that uh, the success of the enterprise architecture team will somewhat be dependent on the degree to which it itself is using big data analytics to answer the types of questions what difference in the reference architecture this framework about what are people most concerned about what are the pain points what you know so the idea that we we turn uh, that type of uh, solution space um, into something that's a sweet spot for the EA function itself. So again, that, that would take a team and that gets to the team itself. It's not just enterprise architects and, and solution architects, but also subject matter experts on more loosely connected. And it's ability, you know, perhaps to leverage to big data analytics. How big does our team need to be now, given the demands we're, we're, we're getting from business? And then what will it be as, as there's less demand? How do we scale up? How do we scale down? Again, what are the particular skills needed uh, for our next hire or our next partnership or our next acquisition? 
right? So I, I think that we're going to have to eat our own dog food in terms of as we look at these, uh, you know, these disruptive sorts of things. The EA team should be should be on the leading edge, almost bleeding edge, uh, because honestly, I've I've trained a lot of folks who who are spending years building their architecture repository and, and almost always are very disappointed by the results. And what do they ultimately say? You know, as they try to name all of the elements and how they're connected so that they can answer questions of their stakeholders, they lose confidence in the data because where they get it in the first place and when was it last updated and there's more data all the time. And so again, I think that uh, we're gonna have to bring in some of this dis disruptive technology into the EA practice itself. And of course, that's going to take stakeholder sponsorship. Uh, but some successes in that area will lead to more successes. And uh, technology then that that gets uh, to to the idea that we are in fact leveraging the cloud uh, and IoT, Internet of Things, you know, for our own, you know, sensing of our own landscape in order to answer, you know, what is the impact of this on that, and what if this and that. I, machine learning comes into play here. Artificial intelligence comes into play. So it's an exciting area, uh, the future of enterprise architecture, right? But a lot of people, and I have a blog out on this, and it wasn't meant to be cute or anything, but a lot of people get confused by the, the term enterprise in terms of enterprise architecture. And my blog was just to say, think of it as essential architecture. And uh, so it, it's very important to scope your, your architecture practice and your involvement very carefully. Uh, but, but, but people need to start perceiving architecture as essential or it will have no future. Um, but we need to recognize it could have very big scope. It could have a very focused uh, scope at, a, at the increment level of, of a particular capability. But uh, I do believe, like I said, I, uh, like was said about me, I did training at Columbia University. They have 17 campuses, but they're big sponsors. So the CIO himself, wh whom I met, uh, is, uh, had 20 people there from across those 17 campuses. They're leading people, some of them former CIOs at other universities now working at, at Columbia, but he says, we need enterprise architecture. It's essential for us in light of the, the big changes we have to make from being a completely stovepipe environment to where we have to, we have to say, what are the services we provide as, a, as an Ivy League school? And how are we providing them now? How will we provide them in the future? And interestingly enough, also in terms of, of modeling languages, is TOGAF plus Archimate. So TOGAF is a framework, Archimate is their, their, their language. Now I train Harley Davidson folks. I just got an email yesterday, just uh, not giving away any secrets here. But I trained on TOGAF, and they said well, they've been learning Archimate on their own. And I go, well, I, I, you know, most people who learn it on their own don't learn it very well. Uh, no offense, but uh, you know, I hope that I hope it's working out for you learning it. But what they're saying is we need some help to to uh, really figure out the whole modeling thing. Well. Three years ago is when I was there, and they were going to pick an EA tool, and the tool was going to do all their modeling for them. Well, that's back to the KSM. You know, a tool is no silver bullet. You have to understand what a framework does for you. You have to understand what what an architecture definition language does for you. And so I said there are a lot of issues about setting up, you know, working in the ecosystem of tools for modeling, for storing of the views, for storing of the reference models, for storing of the standards, for, for, for being able to visibly see the roles and responsibilities and workflow. So there's so much, so much needed for Mature EA overall, but we do have major players stepping up now, often with the TOGAF Archimate. Uh, combination and a new version of Archimate has been released and hasn't yet been incorporated into tools. But it should be very interesting in, the, in Q4 here, 2016, as uh, Archimate is, is rolled out with new tools and the new training, uh, because it's a more expansive language. Not perfect, but 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 again, a lot of people are saying there's such a good combination in terms of the framework plus an architecture definition language. But as I explained to the people at Harley Davidson, it's not just about learning Archimate. You need to know BPMN. You need to, of course, continue to work with UML. You need to go from ideation to, to engineering. So you need to look at your whole ecosystem of, of tools uh, in order to, to uh, 
most efficiently uh, address uh, the descriptions of baseline transition one, transition two to target and uh, look at your, your, your options and to fill your gaps and it takes more knowledge of what are the solutions that are out there and that are that are, will be there in, in another year or two. So there's a lot of knowledge required and tools are going to be important, but I see tools as being more embedded with artificial intelligence and fed with data from different vendors, etc. You know, so I, there's some I could go on on that uh, another time. I do encourage folks just to get a sense of what's possible in the tool on the tools uh, uh, arena horizon is smart facts like only the facts, please. Smartfacts.com. Now, Graham made alluded to the you know how how do people talk about an interface or a function or what have you, but but this tool, smartfacts.com, is to say, look, whether you, you developed the view in Eris or you developed it in Sparks or you developed it in you know XYZ tool, um, you did it in Visio, it doesn't matter. We convert them in, using SVG vector graphics into the same canvas and then allows for analysis using artificial intelligence. And anyway, it's an interesting thing to look at just in terms of what's happening on the visualization front uh, of enterprise architecture. So with that, I'm going to turn back over to, uh, to Ingar. Okay, thanks, Steve. All right, so um, what we're we're going to do is we still have a few more minutes here left here and uh in a moment uh you should be seeing my screen uh pop back up um let's see yeah okay you should, you should be seeing my screen now all right so questions um if you have any questions you want to float by steve or graham go ahead if you haven't done so yet uh, put them over there on a slido uh sli.do event number 6777 and um i think steve you you have you and graham both have access to those questions right now that should be coming across if there are any and uh I'll, i will defer to you two to take a look at what you got and maybe answer one or two of them we got about got about a couple got a couple minutes left okay well i will say that we most certainly can can afford a, a bit of a wiki uh, for the uh, books and articles that we refer to and the websites that we encourage. Excuse a little bit of a background noise on my clock there. Um, yeah, so I'm going to turn my audio off for a second, though, and let Graham take it up. Uh, well, uh, can we get a list of books? Uh, I'll track down the references for the presentation and put them in the paper that you're going to give her uh, access to later and go. Um, okay, great. There's a, there's a question about the future of enterprise architecture. It looks like it's for Steve. Uh, there's one from Lauren. Laurent, uh, I'm not an EA, but working in EA-related activities. Is there really a career in EA? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by a career in EA, because I, I'm saying that the strategy and architecture team would, would include a variety of architects. There's certainly a career in architecture. Uh, and, and whether it, it's a career in EA depends on the organization you're working on but most large organizations need to a solution architect base uh, and a few enterprise architects um, and the last one steve training is a significant investment most organizations stop at certification alone uh, shouldn't ea courses be tailored to specific industries um, i've never found that uh, an issue with with a possible exception of telecoms uh, the courses we give um, seem to be accepted by pretty well everyone. Um, telcos have their own uh, telemanagement forum, enterprise architecture framework, uh, quite specific to them. Uh, but the, uh, the stuff we teach is, is generic to government, banks, um, wh whoever. Well, let me let me jump in on that one then, because in fact, uh, EA principles, that's a major drive for Q4 and next year. So we have uh, EA for government, uh, EA for telcos, we have EA for banks. I just finished uh, some a lot of research on fintech, uh, which I you know, will be very valuable as we, we customize courses for for particular organizations. One of the biggest complaints I've heard in the in the the um, I would say how many 11 years or so that I've been teaching uh, enterprise architecture to around 5,000 people myself 
uh, 40 graduate courses plus plus uh, through the Open Group and the British Computer Society and so on, uh, people are a little frustrated by the generic nature. Now, it's not nearly as generic as project management training. I mean, that's huh. ultra generic. But, uh, but people are saying, you know, I want to have, uh, you know, enterprise for insurance, enterprise architecture for, for a bank, for the modern bank, next generation bank. So we are, we, we are customizing our material to, to do just that. It's not off the shelf, but again, it's modular to, to a degree. There's some basic things like RAM is covered uh, very, very nicely, but there are you, what people want are case studies that are relevant to them using their language and also considering the, the disruptive technologies that are that are in place and, all, and, and so on. So we're really big on that EA principles, and we're partnered with, uh, with Advance here, you know, for the enterprise and solution architecture part. But, but uh, again, we, 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 we are making the investment to do uh, vertical and even more vertical and then company specific uh, EA in terms of training and then possibly leading to some coaching. Yeah. Uh, um, Inga, I, um, go ahead. I'm conscious that, that we may lose people. Are we going to do the closing presentations? Yeah, I was going to suggest that be the last question we answer right now. Um, so to the next, uh, the next slide. Yeah, Ingar, so, let me just say that, the, this, this, Ingar, this, uh, uh, the Slido will be available for a week. So people can continue to ask questions and we can answer them, you know, up, up for a week. That's one reason we're using that technology. Okay, great. Uh, I also want to recommend here on this slide is going to share, if you have any questions specifically for Graham or for uh, for Steve, their email addresses are right here. Just go ahead or and their phone numbers. So go ahead and either them an email or send them a, or give them a call to uh, to ask any other questions. Probably email is probably the, the best way. And yeah, of course you can keep putting your your questions onto that Slido um, uh, uh, system. The why don't we go ahead and uh, and get off the stage here really quick. Uh, so Graham, I'll let you say a, a few words. Actually, before I let you before I hand you over there, Graham. Uh, one of the things I promised everybody, because we are starting to get people uh, to drop off right now, is if you want to get Graham's uh, notes, go ahead and send that email to his email address right there, Graham Beresford, Beresford, sorry, at btinternet.com, and go ahead and type in the in the subject line notes, and that's all you need to prove that you stayed all the way to the end. And uh, Graham, go ahead and why don't you say some uh, uh, notes, and then I'll hand and then I'll hand it over to Steve. Well, we've collected the, uh, the poll responses and summarized them on this slide. Uh, I'll, I'll read them out and it's bad practice, I know, but I shall read them out all the same. 69% uh, work in an architecture role currently, 38% uh, manage architects. So there's really a little overlap there. 65% uh, work mostly at the solution architecture level, 35% at the enterprise architecture level, which is interesting because the, the future of EA is the talk and 65%, two thirds of solution architects. 64% work mostly in the applications and data space. 12% business technology 24. 79% have used UML. That's a high number. 64% have used BPMN. Uh, Archimate lower and IDEF 0%. 71% uh, work in an architecture team of less than six people. Uh, there were a few in the other categories, but they're by far the largest working, uh, or their, either they or their enterprise has an architecture team of less than six people. 78% um, use either TOGAF or another framework, uh, TOGAF dominating that, that space. Uh, and thankfully for me, 94% uh, say that they or their team would benefit from more education in architecture terms and concepts. Uh, which is interesting because presumably people do have some education in TOGAF and or other framework uh, and they still want more. So um, that le leads very nicely, uh, I'm pleased to say, to uh, my concluding remarks, how can we help? Um, both uh, uh, Steve and myself offer TOGAF training. TOGAF training focuses on the architecture development method. Uh, which I've uh, drawn in, in the, the classic graphic. This is the iconic representation of TOGAF. Almost the first thing you have to say on a TOGAF course is, you're not going to learn how to do architecture. This is a management framework for doing architecture. You're supposed to be architects already. Uh, you'll get some pointers to 
where the architect knowledge and skills you have would be useful, uh, but it's not an architecture techniques course. So it's primarily a management framework that promotes uh, the work of architects uh, and gives it structure. Um, our enterprise solution architecture training is more general, broader and deeper than TOGAF. Uh, it's not a particular process. The, the training, uh, I should have mentioned, of course, training for TOGAF leads to TOGAF exams. Uh, training leads to examinations for uh, advanced methods or uh, a wider industry certificate, the BCS professional certificates in enterprise solution architecture. And in the USA, um, uh, EAP are approved suppliers of this training. They're credited to run the associated certification examinations. Uh, just to show you some uh, comments from there, the last course uh, run in London uh, covers the key, uh, the length and breadth of solution architecture concepts, suits both novices and experienced professionals, training helpful, lots of experience discussed, uh, etc. Uh, the training is supported by Abancy Methods, which are um, largely published on my website. I, I retain a, a small amount for people who want the, the full methodology, uh, who pay a small license fee, uh, but 80% of it's on the, uh, on the website. The methodology actually grew out of um, being asked questions on TOGAF and uh, Enterprise Solution Architecture courses, uh, and, and simply wanting not to have to keep repeating the same answer. Uh, and gradually, uh, the, the, it built up and up uh, until it was a, a large and comprehensive methodology in its own right, uh, deliberately shaped in, in, a, in a shape that TOGAF people would recognize. Uh, TOGAF gives you this management framework uh, and advancing methods, uh, I've color coded it here to show some correspondences, is more concrete guidance on architecting itself uh, with quite a strong focus on non-functional requirements, uh, which in my TOGAF course is one slide and it's uh, three or four hours in uh, uh, an advanced methods course. Uh, so the training is supported by the methods resource on the website. Uh, they're not invented by me out of my head. They're, they're a collation of uh, best practice from various sources uh, and from uh, my experiences. Uh, I spent uh, eight years working uh, with a large global systems integrator uh, in, with their architects on their, their practices. So uh, if you would benefit from more education in, arch in architecture terms and concepts, uh, in the Americas, Asia Pacific, um, Steve's the likely source uh, for training UK and Europe, uh, uh, that's me. So th there are contact details on this screen. I think Ingar's got a similar screen later with the contact details. Uh, if you want uh, a paper, uh, the paper associated with this course, which says a little bit more about um, enterprise solution architecture working together, uh, uh, then you can contact me and, uh, at the email address and I'll return it to you. Uh, you can take back now, Ingar. Okay, thanks, Graham. And uh, Steve, uh, your last uh, your last comments, and b b actually, Steve, before you get started, please, uh, if you can, um, uh, mention if you know yet what the topic is for the uh, for everybody actually on this webinar. Keep in mind that we do hold these webinars uh, monthly. Um, and uh, we're going to have, I don't know, Steve, if you could mention what the topic is yet for September, uh, but these are going to be free and always covering hot topics. So go ahead, Steve, take it away, please. The planned topic for September is enterprise architecture and government. We find that we're at a turning point in, in government where they really need enterprise architecture, but it's been a very low priority in the U.S. government. But, but we're talking uh, internationally. I used to do consulting for the United Nations. They're using TOGAF. Um, and uh, I've also done for many state governments. And so we feel like uh, bringing in the, the FEA, the Federal Enterprise Architecture material with the BCS material where appropriate, with uh, Vansier, with TOGAF. But again, the, the focus area is we want government architects to, to increase their knowledge, skills, and maturity. And we're gonna explain, you know, why is that a little special? Well, obviously it's not, um, it's not uh, profit driven, you know, so there's some unique things about government. There are a lot more reports, they're bigger. Uh, investments. So there, we want to explain the ecosystem of government architecture and the opportunities there. So that, that that would be the main thing. The other thing I wanted to just reinforce tied to what, what Graham was saying, you know, he and I are working closely together for the, the advanced methods and uh, trying to get the enterprise solution architecture 
training out there, but it's really not an either or. It's not like why well, do TOGAP, but I, but I can't do BCS or advanced ear. We, we have found unanimously everyone says they want both. You know, so you might not be able to do them week, you know, back to back weeks, but but uh, you know, over time it should be a, you should have a pipeline of a training plan. A lot of people are defaulting too often to kind of project management training. It's very generic and it's not going to help you much as an architect. We'd like to see a lot more people taking uh, framework training, which again we're, we're mentioning two or three frameworks there. Plus, I strongly believe people need modeling training. They need training in Archimate and how it fits in with BPMN and, and others. We will have uh, in October or so, we will have a, a, a seminar, a webinar on, on tools for, for enterprise architecture. And we'll give some demonstrations of different tools. And, and, and I know there's a lot of interest in that. We have a lot of expertise in that. But that's the plan for right now. Yay in government followed by uh, modeling for, for, for architecture. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Well, that's it, folks. Thanks again for participating. Uh, as we mentioned before, the um, uh, you can you can keep putting comments, uh, questions you want over on Slido. And uh, in the meantime, you can also email both Graham and uh, Steve about any questions, other questions you have. And we look forward to seeing all of you next month. Thanks a lot, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ingar.